This is the Adopted Mom Podcast. Adoption may look different for each family, but we need solidarity from other crazy people who took this leap. And that is what we do here. We encourage, we build up, we share the wins and losses. We lean on each other and we get through this together. Thanks for joining us. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Adoptive Mom Podcast, episode five. I'm so excited that we are already at episode five and we've got lots more in store for you, so stick around. Today, we get to talk to Amy Butler. She is a licensed counselor at Waterstone Counseling Center, and this is awesome. Her specialty is working with families of kids from hard places and giving grace to them while helping them walk through the hardest stuff they've ever dealt with. She rocks at this because she and her husband, Chuck, have adopted two children of their own, and that makes four kids total. So they're in this crazy game right along with us. Um, And she and I talked about grace for the strongest moms there are. She is the absolute best at showing you that you are enough and are doing a great job just by saying yes to these kids. We've talked about her in one or two other episodes, and so I'm excited for you guys to finally hear her interview And before we jump right in, there are a couple of quick announcements and just some resources I wanted to give you guys. If you are looking to get into this adoption game and are local to Arkansas, please check out the call for training to adopt from foster care. That's what we went through. And then after you are in open home, check out Project Zero to see the actual real life faces of kids in our state who are waiting for a forever home. If you want to go the private route, you can check out Bethany Ministries, which is who, um, I'm sorry, that is who Sarah Avery from episode three works with, and they are across the country. So even if you're not in Arkansas, you can totally check them out. They are great. If you are already in the throes of adoption of any kind, international, family, private, whatever, no matter where you live, please check out Grace Haven Ministries. They absolutely changed our adoption story for the better, and my husband Brian and I now proudly serve on their board. They can provide support and resources in many different ways, including counseling services. So please don't hesitate to reach out. They are absolutely wonderful, even if you just need to vent, because we all do that. And that's actually how I got started with Grace Haven is Annie, who is one of the directors. I would just text her or call her when I just needed to cry or I needed support. And she's actually going to be featured on this podcast soon. So Thank you guys so much for listening. If you can, I would love it if you would rate and review us on iTunes. That'll help us move up in that ranks. It'll only take a second. Just give us like a star review and then write a few words about how you feel about the podcast. I would just be so, so, so appreciative. So, all right, let's jump right in with our interview with Amy Butler. Hey, Amy, how's it going? Hey, I'm doing really good, Alex. Good. You had um, a eventful day so far? Um, yes, I have. <laughs> I have four kiddos. And so as a mom of four, they keep me pretty busy. And we attempted to attack uh, eye appointments this morning. So no, no easy feat. Yeah, goodness. That sounds like a nightmare. Um, uh-huh. uh, so speaking of four kids, go ahead. Let, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your husband, kids, names, ages, stuff like that. Yeah, well, I have four kids. Macon is my oldest, and she's 10. And then I have an Ellie. She's nine. And then a Wrigley. Um, He is seven. And Deacon is six. And uh, two of them are adopted. um, Two of them are bio kids. And my husband, he is a student pastor here in our area. Um, So that's my crew. And um, so you have like the stair steps. That's super fun. <laughs> yes, I do. And and what's fun about it is they didn't all come into our family in a stair step, but how they look now are stair steps. So we have a, a very creative way of how God built our family. Yeah, that's that birth order effect went out the window a long yes. time ago. Yeah, went out the, went out the window for sure. <laughs> okay, what about you? What do you do? Well, I am a licensed counselor and I enjoy mostly meeting with um, couples, like doing marriage therapy. Um, I tend to get a lot of adoption and foster families, those that have like entered into that world and the unique challenges that those marriages face. And I do a lot of trauma recovery work, uh, things like that. I'm also a trainer for foster parents with the call. Um, So I get to help on the front end, prepare them for that journey. 
Um, and then after they start the journey, I'm a counselor that can help continue to walk them through once they actually are feeling um, the things that they're taught in training. So um, I get to kind of walk with them for quite a while in the journey. When it becomes just really real, because I've talked about this in the podcast before, but I think that we have this like pie in the sky version of hard whenever we start out and we're like, yeah, sure. It's going to be super hard. I get it. And then we start this and we're like, that was hilarious. I had no idea. Absolutely. And we even say that in training. We say, hey, we're we're preparing your brain like you're going to at least be aware on a brain level. But when you actually push play and it goes live and you're actually feeling what it feels like and you're experiencing it, those are two different things. And so um, even though we prepare them the best we can on a brain level, they definitely are still going to need um, someone walking with them as they experience it to be true. I kind of equate it to like, I know that working out is going to be painful, uh, but until I actually start working out, I don't really know what it feels like. Um, So it's kind of the same experience. Yeah. That's a good one. I'm going to have to use that for sure. Um, So basically you're like the actual hands and feet of Jesus. (laughs) You just do a lot of good stuff. Yeah. I, I'm a girl that wants to be practical and um, you know, so many people have, great practical questions um, that pop up that we just um, look for people to kind of help us out with. And so um, anything I can do to help in that area is where my heart is. That's just so awesome. Um, okay. So you talked about just a little bit, your your kids didn't come into your family in an, in an orderly fashion, but go ahead and just tell us that story, that whole, yeah, uh, what got you yeah. into this crazy mess? I'd love to tell my story. Um, you know, my story actually starts before I married my husband, Chuck. Um, I had some exposure to orphan care, if you will, um, when I went to live in Guatemala for three months with a friend of mine in an orphanage. And that was my first exposure to children that were living in this world without parents and uh, really um, impacted my heart. I definitely, even as a young 20 wanted to, um, at some point in my life, make adoption and, and being there for these kids as a part of my life. And so that became very, very important to me even before I got married. And so when I married Chuck, we both said, hey, we're going to make adoption as part of our family planning. And so um, we had a bio kid, uh, Macon. Um, and then after that, uh, we got pregnant again and had a miscarriage. And kind of after Having going through the experience of a miscarriage, we were like, well, you know, we don't really know how God is going to um, use adoption, who, what, where, why, when. So we're going to go ahead and start the process after this miscarriage and just see what's going to happen. And so we started the process and we got pregnant again with Wrigley. And so we had to put it on hold. And so we had our rig man and um, you have to wait, you know, a few months after he is born to start the process again. And so we did. We started the process after Ruby was born about six months after he was born. And and we did domestic adoption um, the first go around. And so um, so we uh, we're open and um, about a year into being open, we were chosen by a birth mom that later chose to uh, parent her child at the hospital after she had him. Um, And so they call that a disrupted adoption. And so that really threw our hearts for a loop. Um, We weren't expecting that, but we know it's a part of the journey and we greatly respected her decision. Um, A big part of going into adoption was um, even the adoption agency we chose. We we love them because of how much they care about their birth moms. Um, And so we are all about birth moms and, you know, just hold them in the highest place of honor. Um, And so the fact that she chose to parent um, her child, we were we were very excited for her, but also very sad for us at the same time. Um, So kind of weird feelings there all over the place. Um, And so then a year after that is when we got the phone call that a birth mom had chosen us for her child um, to parent him. And she had already signed away her rights and he was already born. Um, and that's where we met Deacon. Um, we got him when he was 33 days old. And um, and so that was our first experience with adoption. And he is African-American and outside of our race. Um, so it's a, a cross-cultural adoption. And so we began to have the journey of having a family that didn't all look the same. Um, that's when we started that journey. Yeah. And so as when we got Deacon, 
and started um, living life with him, we just still felt like our family wasn't finished. We felt like we still had another kiddo somewhere out there through adoption. We were, we, we felt um, we were done with biological, um, having biological children. And so we just really still felt like there's a, another child out there. We weren't, we weren't sure. And we weren't in any hurry. And um, we just knew some other child was out there. And so in the meantime, our church asked us to go to a conference to help them with their, their church um, orphan care ministry. And so they sent us to Austin, Texas, and we went to this conference, and we all broke up and did different breakout sessions. And my husband and I, we didn't mean to or realize it, but we ended up going to all of the foster care breakout sessions. (laughs) And prior to that, we had zero heart for foster care. I mean, I didn't understand it. I didn't have a vision or a heart for it at all. Um, in fact, as a counselor, um, I, I have worked with kids that um, have been in the foster care system when they're teenagers. And, you know, they were always pretty hard uh, when I worked with them as a counselor in like the psych hospitals and stuff. So I actually had a pretty hardened heart towards foster care and thought, no way, those people that do that are crazy. And so I go to this conference and every single session is about the heart of foster care and the ministry mindset behind it and just, you know, how these kids um need very safe adults to walk towards them. And so we left that conference and my husband and I looked at each other and we said, I think that's how we're supposed to find our child is through foster care. I think that's where we're going to find her. Wow. We felt like it was a girl, um, African-American, just like um, Deacon, um, so that they could have um, some similarities in that in a family that is white. Um, and so we we're like, all right, let's do it. Um, and so about a year after that, we didn't jump in and we just kind of kept praying about it and looking for the venue to do it. And that's when the call came to Northwest Arkansas. And as soon as I saw that happen, I said, Chuck, that's, that's, I think that's how we're supposed to do this through the call venue and get trained through them. And let's start looking for our daughter. Um, so that's where, um, we got onto the track of foster care, um, in order to find a daughter uh, that we felt led to adopt. And so we did the adoption only track, even though while we were at that conference, we got a major heart and vision and, and ministry attitude towards foster care. And we did not feel personally led to go that route because we already did a ton of ministry and we felt overwhelmed by adding the ministry to birth families and all the really crazy cool ministry that you do as a foster parent. And that seemed to overwhelm us with all the other ministry things we were doing. And so we said, you know, I I think we're just supposed to do adopt only. And so um, took that journey um, as any process in adoption, as anyone that has gone through that process. It is not fast. Um, It's a process and you kind of have to warrior through paperwork and, you know, uh, physicals and all kinds of stuff. So it takes a while and then you're working in the system and, you know, and it just takes them a while to match you. Yeah. There's no impulsive, there's no impulsivity in this process. No, no. (laughs) And, and it, and it really kind of in a unique way is very similar to like when you're, when you go through a pregnancy process before the child comes, you know, that process is trying to prepare you for that child um, and so the adoption process is, you know, similar to that in that it, it makes you go through a many months, sometimes year process um, before the fruition of a child. Um, yeah. And so it, it kind of seeks to prepare you for hard, actually, um, because not not much of it is easy. It's pretty turbulent um, at times. So we long story short, we were uh, matched with two girls um, in the foster care system and they uh, we're from a different county than ours, and they were um, ready for adoption. And um, it was a pretty turbulent ride as far as, um, you know, getting matched and getting all the paperwork and um, meeting them for the first time. And the way that they came into our home was under an emergency placement due to some things that were going on in their personal story. And so, you know, them coming into our home was incredibly turbulent, Um uh, I look back now and I'm like, man, how did we survive? I have no idea. Um, yeah. Both girls had really, really high trauma. And um, we knew that on paper. But like I said, your your brain can get ready. But you're, when you actually experience it, it's a whole nother thing. Um, and so really what these girls had been through and all the symptoms that showed what they had been through 
um, really flipped our, our sweet little family of five upside down. Um, you know, we, we, we didn't know what hit us at that point. And, um, so it was very, uh, turbulent is probably the best word I can think of for that time. Um, I think we just were surviving Alex, like, in pure survival mode. Um, and just so like we got the, above water, uh, water. Up oh, to your absolutely. Chin. And, and most of the time we probably were underwater. I, I don't really know. It's hard to describe. <sighs> um, I feel you. so, so yeah, so we just kind of jumped in and, and school was right around the corner and we just did our best to get them placed academically. And, and the school we are in was great to ask a lot of questions and want to accommodate their needs and, um, you know, just to set them up for success. And, you know, at, at one given point in time, I started counting all the specialists that we had put around these girls to help them to get caught up. Um, and we had about seven professionals around each girl. Um, so total, we had 14 professional people walking towards these girls, um, and all their gaps and, um, just helping us. It was like a village. It was really cool to watch. Um, I recognized early on, I can't do this by myself. I'm going to need a lot of help. Um, and so we had a lot of people circle us and, you know, it probably didn't take very long before I recognized that the older one had some very, very significant trauma, even more so than the DHS system knew about. Um, and so in my training, it probably gave me a pretty unique perspective because I could kind of decipher what it is that I'm seeing and the behaviors of these girls. Um, and the oldest one became increasingly more and more unsafe to be around the younger four um, kids that were underneath her. She was older than everybody. Um, and so put us in some pretty, yes. Yeah. Put us in some pretty hard spots. Um, you know, to kind of give a picture of what our world looked like. Um, you know, we had alarms on our doors so that every night we put the kids to bed, we put alarms on the doors. So if the doors opened at night, it would be really loud. Um, so we have some pretty funny stories about that. And <laughs> we forget that people didn't know we had alarms on our doors and they'd come over and hang out with us. And then one of the kids would come out of their room and they would freak out like, what, what's going on? Um, and like a tornado, so, uh, drill yes, or tornado, something. Tornado, what is that? <laughs> and so we, um, so we are normal. There was no normal. Like what is normal anyway? Um, <laughs> we, we became a family that did whatever it took to keep kids safe and to keep kids going forward developmentally. Um, and it didn't matter what was normal anymore. It was a war, you know, and we were just trudging through to go, try to go forward um, you know, we had to have a rule for everything. I had charts for everything. I made sure certain kids didn't sit together because they couldn't handle it. I mean, it, wow. it was insane. I went from, I went from a very peaceful family dynamic to a incredibly chaotic, uh, full of trauma, full of anxiety, full of fear, um, dynamics within my family. And so, um, so the oldest one, um, was able to stay about six months in our home and we, um, made a decision with her therapeutic and DHS team to disrupt her from our home for safety reasons. Wow. Um, we felt like within the home, um, a family system, we were able to see really how sick she really was. And so, um, her level of care, um, and her needs needed to have something higher, and so we transitioned her to a home that I got to be a part of and picking, which I love that. They, they trusted me enough to help navigate um, that sweetie pie to a place that could really help her. And uh, so we all worked together. It was beautiful. Um, her entire rap team um, came around us and her, and we got her to a safe place. Um, and, and so we call that, you know, disruption. So she was the half-sister of Ellie, who is still living with us, and we have officially adopted her. So she is officially a butler, and uh, her older sister is not. Um, and so our adoption story um, and our family is not uh, cookie cutter. It's not pretty. It's not, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's messy, um, and it's all over the place, and yet beautiful all at the same time. Um, it's, it's probably not a popular thing to talk about disruptions, um, but they happen for really good reasons. Yeah. And we all, and we all grieve about them all at the same time. It's not necessarily a, a happy thing, but you know, often adoptive families feel a lot of relief when a disruption happens because the needs of the child are so great. 
um, that the family seems to go underwater um, with those needs. And so here we are. We have these four kiddos. Um, they're doing great. Um, they're thriving and developing and doing great in school. And, you know, we're moving forward. We still have a lot of hard things that we're still trying to work through, um, especially with our two adopted kiddos. They seem to have a little bit more gaps than our bio kiddos. And so we just have to get creative and keep helping them work through um, whatever developmental blocks that they need to keep moving forward. So, so that's, you know, that's kind of the overview of our story. Of course, I have, you know, thousands of stories that kind of fill in those blanks, but that's kind of the gist of our story. Just, yeah, just every adoptive family. It's like, how do I possibly nutshell this? Right. Um, but I cut, so just a couple of things, and you mentioned several times things that to people listening that might not be familiar with adopting through foster care might seem um, extreme or out of the ordinary, but things like finding things in your kids that nobody else knew about, like issues or sicknesses or, or uh, diagnoses or anything like that, that's actually just super common. I mean, we've oh, experienced yeah. it in our family. I'm sure you see that on your couch across from you in your office over and over and over again, just like nobody told us this is what was going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. These kids, you know, especially if you adopt through the foster care system, you know, they've been through a lot. We call them kids that come from hard places and the file that you get on them is is going to be part of the picture. You know, the DHS system gives you the best picture they can give, but there is no way they're going to know everything. And so the beauty of these children getting into healthy, safe families is that they, um, is that these uh, healthy adults in their life can begin to um, assess them and, and find find the gaps that other people have not seen yet. And a lot of times we don't even see them until something happens or you begin, they go to school and, and we begin to see that, you know, how they're doing socially or academically. And, and so some of it's just a process of discovery. Um, but we can pretty much, you know, assume most of the time that you're, you're not probably getting the whole picture when you get a kiddo in your house. Yeah, just absolutely. And I mean, I don't know anyone who hasn't seen that. I mean, there are a few people maybe that were pleasantly surprised, like if they got a baby that had drugs in her system or something, and then she really didn't have that many issues. I'm just like, what happened? How? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. Um, because yeah, that's not our story. Um, Okay, so, I mean, let's talk about this disruption a little bit, because you you mentioned that that's not a popular topic, and I know that there was a journey for you to come to a piece about that, Um, and that's another thing that we're surprised at how often it happens. I mean, disruptions happen, and they happen a lot more than we think they do. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, how how did you feel? What emotionally, at that point, I mean, the day she left, did you feel any guilt? Did you feel any shame, or were you just completely at peace at that point? Yeah, the... Uh, you know, in my position as the mom, um, I was kind of the walker out of a lot of things. And my husband was completely right beside me, but his full-time job in supporting us, you know, that's primarily where his time was spent. And so walking up to the day um, where we told her and the day that we disrupted, um, it was it was very heavy um, on on my shoulders. And, you know, I felt tightness in my chest and um, it was it was a really heavy time, and I recognized, um, you know, how did I survive back there? I remember thinking sometimes if I can just make it through the next five minutes, if I can just make it through the next hour, um, I began to start thinking like that because that's how probably not okay I was in walking through that that week where we actually disrupted, um, you know, so. So right next to that reality was incredible amounts of relief um, because this is a child that kept me on high alert. I was hyper vigilant all the time, just waiting for her to hurt one of the younger four kids. And so the relief that I felt that we had a plan that was going to keep her safe and moving forward and was going to allow our other four children to be safe and move forward. I felt incredible amounts of peace and relief. Um, So it's very odd to fill those two things at the very same time. Um, incredible amounts of peace, all of all, you know, all at the same time that right next to that, I felt incredible heaviness and, and like what we're walking is really intense. And so I felt the heavy and the, and the impact of what was happening. But I also at the same time had 
relief. And as far as guilt, um, I, I didn't feel a lot of guilt. And I think that surprises a lot of people. People will even ask me when they're brave enough, Hey, don't you just feel so bad about doing that? Like, <laughs> like maybe you didn't like try hard enough or work hard enough. And, and I'm like, well, if I, if I didn't now I do, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but no, I would, I would answer them honestly. And I would say, unless you've had a child in your home, that makes everyone feel unsafe. You simply do not know what it, what it is to be where I'm at. Like in this moment of disrupting and, um, in, in, and as gracious as I can get that disrupted child to a place of safety where she can be okay. Um, you know, guilt wasn't really a part of that equation, um, because we had walked it so closely with Jesus and, you know, um, and it wasn't a matter of I didn't try hard enough. It was that I was equipped and trained to know to to make really good decisions for children. Um, and I think that God knew that. And so, you know, I didn't see all that, what I just said, until probably about six months to a year after we disrupted. Because, you know, um, know this, like after we disrupted, even though I knew we were going in the right direction, it was going to help everybody. Imagine how scary that is for your children, for one of the other kids to disappear. Um, yes. you know, We've that, that can, yes, absolutely. It creates a lot of fear because they can't, they can't make sense of that in their little hearts and their brains. And so even though me and my husband knew this is our way of protecting our family, we knew we were going to have to go through a little bit more turbulence as we dealt with the grief and loss of, of, of a person in our family that we called sister daughter, um, it's just, you know, no books are written for this, right? Like we, yeah. we were navigating it just kind of on our own, trying to figure it out. And so I went into keep walking this out with my family so that we're okay. You know, we, we let our kids grieve. We let them be sad. We let them put whatever words they needed to, to that so that they could make sense of that experience. And, and so because I went into another war mode, which is make sure my kiddos are going to navigate this disruption well, um, I didn't pay any attention to me at all. Um, and so probably about six months to a year later when my mama heart knew my family was going to be okay, like we're, we were more in the clear and we were less turbulent. That is when I started processing what that did to me, you know, like to start putting words to it. And, and that's when, you know, my faith in Jesus came as such a strength during that time, because when I would just talk to Jesus about it and say, man, I feel like I failed you. Like, I feel like, you know, we thought you, we, we prayed really hard and we had these two girls come into our home. We, we feel like this is what you told us to do. And one of them is here and one of them isn't, you know, I don't, I, I don't know how to reconcile that. And in the process of just confessing to Jesus, my, my shame and just my, my doubt or my confusion about the whole situation, I'll never forget when I just kind of felt like he was saying to me, hey, Amy, you did exactly what I knew you would do. And it was my plan. And you defined what success was going to look like, which I had to find it that two little girls were going to get adopted forever into my family. Yeah. Um, he had different plans. And, you know, when we were a big part of making sure Ellie is safe for a lifetime and and we got her to a place of safety and her and her sister being separate is what is for her good. And, and, and I don't know many people um, that would be able to pull off something like that um, in the way that we did it in such a short amount of time. And so that was not our goal ever from the beginning. But as we watched the dynamics unfold, we gave it everything we got had to keep that girl into our home with every healing person we could possibly put around her Um and it just became very clear um, that the safety level was not going to ever be there um, for her to be around her little sister, half sister. And so, right. Um, so, yeah. So as far as that guilt question, you know, I don't know that guilt was a big factor in my heart. It was more just, you know, I would doubt like, hey, did I get that right? Like, did I do that the way you wanted me to? Did I let you down um, as far as my questions for Jesus? Oh, totally. Um, yeah. Well, and I know you told me the other day that whenever you start to feel that doubt, you look at Ellie and how she's thriving and doing so well and you say worth it. And absolutely. You're right. Yeah. Every time I look at her, 
you know, when she came to us, she was six years old, but the inside of her was more like 18 months old. Um, I know that's hard to imagine. I mean, she was toddling, talking like a baby, wanted to be held. And so she was really, really not in a good spot. And so when I look at Ellie now and I see how well she is doing and she's doing well academically and she's learning socially and all of her therapists are giving thumbs up, you know, as we do assessments all along the way. So, and she's using her big girl voice and she's, I mean, she's, I'm so proud of her. She's come so far and overcome so many hard obstacles in her life. And, and we know that if just given safety, if her basic needs are met and she feels safe, and then all of a sudden those building blocks get built and she can start thriving again. Um, but in that disruption or before we disrupted, there was not safety. Um, yeah. Her sister was not safe. So absolutely. And and we've, we've totally dealt with that in our family as well, just with, um, with, with sending Clark to a place that can hopefully heal some of that trauma. And you were a big part of that decision for us and encouraging mm-hmm. us. And I want to get into that. Um, and I'm very sorry. I have a potty situation. <laughs> um, <laughs> is there any way you can just like, I mean, do go about your business and I'll just take my headphones off for just like, like take five for a second. I'm yeah. so sorry. This has yeah, literally no. never happened during recording. I feel really bad. No. And I don't think you should take it out. I think this is hilarious. <laughs> This is real life, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. Go go for it. Okay. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So Grady, our two-year-old who is like freshly potty trained, and we have this big bag of Starburst that we were bribing him with, comes into the office where I'm recording butt naked from the waist down, holding this giant bag, and was like, Mommy, I went potty. And I was like, oh, crap. (laughs) That is so funny. Yeah. Anyway, so, okay. Um, so we were just talking about just guilt and how you felt after that disruption and how you see how Ellie is thriving and you say worth it. And that kind of leads us into why one of the reasons why I just love talking to you, because I feel like one of your big missions is to give grace to adoptive moms and to show them that what they're doing matters and it's not that they're not measuring up, but that that Christ is already enough and they're already saying yes in the best way possible. So talk to us a little bit about that. Absolutely. I, I think I have such a strong um, heart ministry for adoptive and foster moms. I think that we have a warrior spirit about us willing to do incredibly hard things on behalf of our children and the children that are entrusted to our care. And what I've come to know in that place about my own personal story and just those that have entrusted me with their heart journey, other mamas, is just that we're pretty hard on ourselves. Um, You know, we tend to desire uh, for everything to feel or to be able to pull off what maybe biological families can pull off, whether it be in the way our children um, behave or look or you know, um, you know, how they perform, you know, we might, um, feel the pressure um, for our families to look a certain way, mostly probably because we know other people don't understand. Um, they've not either been educated or exposed to kids that come from hard places. And so Mm -hmm. there's just a lot of pressure on a, on an adoptive foster mama's heart. And so, um, and in those places, I think we're pretty hard on ourselves and, and probably the hardest thing to give ourselves is grace. Um, And so as a counselor and in my training, I love how that plus my heart for adoptive and foster mamas go together in that my training helps me to know how to grace people and how to walk towards their um, troubled hearts and the things that we struggle with. And, you know, kind of like, why do we do what we don't want to do and don't do what we do want to do? And my training helps me to go towards moms to help them answer questions like that, you know, and just to really make sense of, you know, when we're not doing well and, you know, we yell at our kids or when we, you know, are extra hard on maybe an adoptive or foster kid um, and the why, you know. Um, So we have a lot going on with us in this process. And most of us never look at ourselves um, because we're so focused on our babies or children that we're trusted with. So, um, so that's a big deal in this process. Yeah. And to put it in, in Amy words, 
if you will, um, you you look at that fire and you walk towards it instead of running away. And I think that so many listeners, maybe not if you're walking this journey, but maybe even if you did a different kind of adoption, um, you don't realize. I mean, there are a lot of counselors that are not trauma informed and they don't mm-hmm. they don't know how to walk families through the fire. But you're really good at, at taking women, especially and saying, like, no, let's walk through this pain. Let's look at it. Let's turn it over in our hands and let's figure out how to move on with it. Absolutely. I, I think a lot of uh, well-meaning counselors really do want to help these moms or these families um, with these difficult kids. And and so a lot of times we'll focus on the kid like, well, mom, if you'll do this, this and this, maybe maybe it will help the kids behavior change. Um, a lot of models or um, counselors might go in that direction. And, and really what I've learned in the process of my own journey and, and walking with others in their journey is that really um, there's no one looking at them. And so if a parent comes in, I'm all about saying, hey, what's going on? And they'll usually report some kind of behavior in their children. And I say, and what's that doing to you? What's that like for you? And I, I turn the questions towards their heart because really it's the most gracious thing to do to give them um, space and time to begin to put words to what the experience is like for them to care for a child that comes from hard places. Because um, the model of counseling that I do helps us to see that the caregiver in this matters big time. And if we're not okay, we will not be able to do what it is that our children that come from hard places needs from us. Um, And so being able to have some space and time um, to be cared for themselves. They're probably pretty uncomfortable with that because they'd prefer to talk about their kids um, because that's where their mama heart is. Um, but what I know is when we go towards, you know, all those things that us um, adoptive and foster parents struggle with, man, there's so much grace to be discovered there. Um, so much insight and self-awareness that helps us to understand that maybe my kid's stuff that drives me crazy and annoys the mess out of me bumps up against things that I've been through. And, you know, it begins to threaten my ability to survive. And so from those places, the child and I am not doing okay. Um, And so how do we unwind those cycles? We begin to pay attention to the caregiver and grace them, help them to see why they do what they do and why they get stuck with certain kiddos. And so we see a lot of relief happen there and a lot of healing between parent and child when we allow the caregiver to put words to their pain. Yeah. And I feel like there's a, you know, maybe it's a process for some, but for so many women that I've talked to that are, that are walking through this, I feel like there comes a moment where it clicks, where you realize that self-care is the opposite of selfish when you're in this situation. And I mean, for me, it was like, it was like, oh, okay, I, that makes sense now, you know, and maybe, mm-hmm. and, and what I hate is that I, I feel like for so many of us, we have to get to the point where we are drowning before we, before we see that. Absolutely. A lot of times, I mean, it's my story. I, I had to get to a place of desperation. I, I know that kind of an indicator to me that I wasn't okay. This is how little insight I had. And I was a counselor at this time, by the way, I had zero <laughs> insight into my own emotional health And when I knew I was not okay is one morning, one of my kids spilled an entire gallon of milk on my kitchen floor. And my reaction to that spilled milk did not match the crime. Um, I like had a rage feeling um, happen inside of me. And I had to work really hard to, to not let that fully come out on my kids and just scream and yell at them more than just a normal losing my cool, but like a rage yeah. kind of place. And so when that happened to me, you know, I'm as chilled out and laid back as you get. And so for me to be in a place of rage um, over spilled milk, um, really that opened my eyes like, hey, I'm not okay. Um, I was functioning. I was getting things done. Um, so it's kind of deceiving. You don't really maybe sometimes know if you're okay or not. And so that helped me to see And after that, I went to my doctor and said, I need some medicine. Um, I need something to help chill me out here. I'm not okay. And and I also went on a healing journey where I started talking to somebody um, to begin to help me to put words to what had happened to me. And so, you know, we don't, we don't, as mamas, we don't, we don't think about ourselves naturally, right? Like that's, and so to, to start thinking about ourselves and putting words to that can begin to feel selfish or I'm making things all about me. 
um, of course, you know, and we don't, we don't want that. And so we avoid it, but really, um, the healing model that we know, and is even biblical, if you really start to think about scriptures that begin to have you guarding your heart above everything else, because out of it comes everything. Um, the Bible supports self-care, soul care, being self-aware so that you know how to talk to Jesus about what's going on inside of you. Definitely. And oh my gosh, that's, who. That's a good word right there. Um, so I had a, I had two specific things that I have heard come out of your mouth that have really impacted me, and I wanted you to expound on them. And the first one was this hierarchy of needs, and I feel like I learned about that, you know, in like some 101 class in college. But yes, um, yes, I think that the, when you told me this, it was at a point where I was feeling like I was just the worst mom ever because we've already learned and we've even already talked about it in this podcast that love for your adoptive kids looks completely differently sometimes than love for your biological kids. And it doesn't make it any less love. And absolutely, you helped me realize that because I was just feeling just completely buried in garbage because I felt like I just didn't love Clark. I was you know, all these other things. And you were like, no, you do. And look at, look at why. So what, uh, talk to us about that. Absolutely. Um, I'm a big visual person and Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, it's that triangle that's big at the bottom and goes up into a triangle and it kind of breaks down five different things that kind of are building blocks within a human. Um, I like it, you know, because it's a visual, it helps us to see that these are just basic building blocks that, um, are necessary for the next building blocks to be built. And so when you think about our foster and adoptive kids, you know, a lot of times the very bottom of the hierarchy of needs are not being met. You know, those are the physiological needs. Um, that's the food, water, warmth, the rest. And so when you think about the conditions um, in which DCFS has to remove a child, um, oftentimes even those basic needs are not being met. And so when you think about a child that's coming into your home from um, hard places, um, really just meeting those very basic physiological needs are more than you could possibly imagine. Um, so when you think about it with your biological family, um, you take these for granted that you feed your kid three times a day, that you give them um, water, clean water, um, that you give them a warmth, you know, that um, that there's there's some level of safety there. Um, and rest, you know, that you put them to bed every night, that, that an adult says, hey, it's time for bed. Um, we take those for granted. Those are just like basic 101 parenting skills that we just instinctively do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when we have these kids come into our home and we're providing those things, those might not have been provided for um, before. They might have, um, but just for the sake of this conversation, let's assume they weren't. And so how much do you think it means to a kid's body and brain that their, that their body is being fed three times a day with snacks? Yeah. How much do you think it means to a kid? We know water is incredibly essential to survival, um, that they get watered, right? Hydrated. Um, how much do you think it means to a kid that somebody is protecting them by saying, Hey, you can't stay up till 11 or midnight. It's time to go to bed at seven or eight. Um, and ensuring that their body gets the rest that it needs. Um, so a lot of times these um, biological families, they've got good reasons for why they aren't able to provide that for their children. They might be really tangled up in their own stuff. And so here they are in a safe home and they're getting these things. Those are incredibly huge building blocks for the foundation of which everything else can build. And so when these kids aren't feeling their um, physiological needs being met, um, they really can't build much, um, which is why these kid why these kiddos need PT and OT and ST and all the therapies, because their bodies begin to not be able to do what they're designed to do and grow and develop when, when their needs are not basic, basic needs aren't being met. Yeah. And so, and so when I say that, when I, I even want to pause on that, like, um, that's a huge grace area for us mamas, um, you know, that even in the most thing, the things that even we, we don't know how to give ourselves credit for, if you could see the inside of these kids, you could see that every time you're consistently doing those things, that you are building incredible things inside that child. And um, if that's the only thing you do, that's a, that's winning. 
um, you are winning. Um, that, that is really helping that child out a lot. Yeah. Um, and we really, yeah. I mean, we do take those things for granted with our biological kids and we just don't think about it. And I remember mm-hmm. when you first told me this and I was like, well, yeah, of course I feed him, you know, and you were telling me a story about Ellie and how you were shocked that she was wanting like a plan for the next six meals or whatever. Like she wanted to mm-hmm. make sure that she was going to be fed. Yes. Yes. Because when children know the feeling of starvation and have food insecurity in their past, um, just simple feeding consistently or even posting a feeding plan. We, we ended up posting something on our cupboard that if she ever started to feel scared about food, I'd say, Hey, go look at, go look at the paper on the cabinet. And she'd go over there and look at it. And I've said, do you see where the, where we're going to eat? And that at any time you can get a snack from this healthy bowl. Um, you know, so just constantly reassuring those places in her brain that, remember starvation and remember not having anything to eat. Um, we were, she loves to just open the pantry door and just look at the food. And um, that's very comforting to her. And so just, just very basic things are incredibly powerful in the souls and minds and brains of these children. For sure. Okay. So what's that next level? So the next level is the safety one. And that's, that's just where they feel safe and secure. Um, and when I talk about this one, you know, this one's like um, that there aren't strangers walking through your house day and night, you know, that there's um, that that they have a room and a right for no one to uh, come in and um, touch them inappropriately at night or, you know, just just things like this that um, that may be. Um, these families that are the safe families, you know, they get these children in their care. Um, they don't, they don't, they take that for granted as well. You know, just the fact that a, a daddy goes to work and comes back home, that's a big deal. The fact that we all sleep, like we go to bed in our designated spaces, that's a big deal. All of those things create safety and security. And also these routines are, feel incredibly safe when they can feel that their world is predictable um, their their brain and their body is beginning to calm down um, because they start to count on things, which is why they might seem kind of rigid. You know, if we get off of our routine, sometimes they freak and you're like, wow, that does not match this routine change. <laughs> and yet and yet really it does. If you could see their brain, you know, because, man, what did that make them think about the last time they felt out of control when they couldn't see what was in front of them and really scary things happened right around the corner, you know? Yeah. Um, and so predictability, that's why it's such a big deal. And that's that second layer, you know, so, so for grace, for these mamas, you know, just the fact that you are providing a safe, secure environment for your children. Wow. is powerful. Um, again, you're going to feel like you're not doing anything because this is like what you would do for anybody. This is what you would do for your, your bio kids. Like this is like no brainer stuff. And we give ourselves zero credit here. So that's why I outline those two, because there's so much power in doing things that you just take for granted or you think is not a big deal. And yeah, just not even thinking about the things that are involved in those first two levels. They equal love and, mm-hmm. and they're seen as love by these kids. And I think that's something that I didn't realize. Like I thought they were just givens and that any love that was to be felt was what I did on top of those. But those were wearing me out, just making sure mm-hmm. that I was answering all the questions from this kid about what we were eating tomorrow night and where we were going and who was going to be driving. And I was like, I don't know, chill, you know, and, and, but so, so I had exhaustion on top of just fulfilling those things and just realizing that those things equaled love to him. Yes, that's exactly right. And, and because if you ask these kids, you know, some of them that are verbal and can share, you know, does your foster mama, does your, your mama love you? And they'll say yes. Like they'll be like, oh yeah, you know, most of them will, you know, when these security and physiological needs are being met. Um, because the third one is where I think that most mamas have a lot of guilt if they're honest. Um, the next level is the belongingness and love needs. Um, this is where they develop intimate relationships and friends. So know if you're not being fed and you don't have, you're not hydrated and you're not feeling safe, um, relationships, intimate relationships are um, incredibly hard, if not impossible to do um, for a child. And, and so, and this is also hard for the caregivers. You know, if I'm 
if I am meeting psycho, uh, uh, physiological and safety needs in this child and they're incredibly, uh, they come from hard places and they're incredibly, um, you know, have a lot of fear and insecure in those areas, I'm working really hard in those areas um, to reassure them about food and safety. And so all my work is going into level one and level two. I'm probably not going to have the feels in my heart to be close to this child intimately. Oh, yes. And that might be hard for me. You know, I might actually resent them for being so needy. Um, and <laughs> want, and they might be the last kid on the planet I want to give a hug or, or to be soft and tender with at the end of a day of meeting their level one and level two needs. Um, and so that's where I give the most grace to moms. I want to help them to see, give yourself credit for level one and level two. Um, those are really, really big jobs with these kids. And then the belongingness and the love needs, they'll get there, right? Like as you're, as their gappiness is closing on the, the bottom of the triangle and they're beginning to get more, um, you know, feel safer and they're feeling safer and they're feeling more connected to you as a caregiver, as those things begin to happen, um, you as a caregiver will have less pressure on you, which will give you a buffer within yourself to even be able to start meeting their belongingness and love needs. And so I basically tell them, I don't know how, how good of a job anybody would do on level three if level one and level two is still your primary job. Um, if they don't feel safe yet, if they haven't identified you as their need meter and their caregiver, that's your only job. You know, and it and it might not feel pretty. You might not have the fuzzy the fuzzy lovey dovey feelings toward that child. And that's okay. That's very normal and, and can somewhat be impossible until you kind of get over these um, stage one, stage two needs. Wow. And I've heard that before and it still feels um, just as much like the warm fuzzies coming out of your mouth. So it's just so good to hear those things. Absolutely. Um, okay. So then, and those top levels are a little bit more um, like that natural love, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, it's the esteem um, where the child gets to have a sense of esteem and confidence within themselves. And then the last one is self-actualization. That's where you're achieving your full potential. And so really, I mean, all of us are kind of still in four and five, um, even as adults. And so really, we just know that as we're building these blocks for these children that come from hard places, we're, we are doing our part to get them to move forward in life. It's just going to look different than kids that do not come from hard places. Um, they cannot be held to the same standard. I, I laugh with my adoptive mamas. We all know how to celebrate the most ridiculous things, and we laugh at ourselves <laughs> because there. I had a friend text me the other day and said, um, we made it through the first week without punching anyone in the face. I'm so excited. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh, that's such a big deal. I'm so excited for you. If you know, And who would have thought – that that would be something we would celebrate. And yet adoptive mamas know that our kiddos have big feelings and they don't know what to do with them. And sometimes it can come out in ways that are not socially acceptable. Um, and, and so we celebrate together. We say, hey, I know what a big deal that is. That's a really big deal. Um, so we laugh with each other when, you know, we celebrate things that other people don't know how to celebrate. Um, oh, yeah. Because nothing comes naturally to us. And we have to work really hard for every developmental milestone. Nothing comes easy for us most of the time. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's such a good way to put it that we have to work so hard for each developmental milestone that people do pay for granted. But, um, yeah, that's what you were saying about, um, about celebrating the small wins. That's like me leaving church and being like, uh, rock didn't push any of the small babies down today. So it was a yes. good day. Yes. We go, yes, that's a good day winning. <laughs> Oh, mm -hmm. That's awesome. And, you know, just as an encouragement to any other women out there, if you're like me and, and maybe you maybe you never get out of of those first two levels while your kid is living in your home. And that's OK, too. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you're doing your part. And I just imagine, you know, what I what I love to say to adoptive mamas or foster mamas like you said, yes when most people do not. And so it's the, it's the ones that aren't that tend to look at situations like this with their head cocked and they don't really get it and they're unsure. And sometimes they're even hard on us, right. Mm -hmm. From a place of not understanding. But I, I just want to give spiritual eyes to adoptive moms out there and say, Jesus sees you and he is well pleased that you said yes to hard 
and he is cheering you on and he sees those little successes and he sees the wrestling that we all have to do and um, to help our kids develop and build building blocks, even if the people around us can't see and don't know how to appreciate the war that we daily engage. Um, and so to all the adoptive mama hearts out there, he is very pleased that you said yes um, to what most people uh, do not ever entertain because, you know, most people will say, oh, I don't want to get my heart attached or, you know, that would be too hard, you know, but adoptive mamas, you guys are warriors and Jesus is very pleased by that. And you're engaging a mess on his behalf and he is pleased by that. And it's going to look messy and he expects it to look messy. And so you get nothing but grace from him. Whew. Those words feel good. Um, and actually you took the words out of my mouth because that's what, that was what I was going to ask you about next. That was that other just giant piece of grace that you've given me before. And I actually, uh, me and Kelly Kraut talked about you a little bit in my interview with her and about how you said that and you, you told me, um, you said yes. When most people say no, well done, good and faithful servant. Absolutely. Yes. That's, that's a, it's a really big deal. You know, when we engage um, the war over people's hearts, especially the the younger generation, that without us staying, standing in the gap for them, there's no telling where they would be. Um, and so in the mess, in the war zone, when things aren't pretty, um, I hear Jesus speaking that over his warriors. Well done, good and faithful servant. You said yes. Whew. Yep. Yeah. So, okay. Um, that was so great. And I, I'm kind of at a loss for words right now because I'm still like processing <laughs> everything you've said, even though, again, I've already heard all this, but it still is just so grace giving. Um, OK, but I do have some just kind of these are like the quick question rounds. Yeah, that your answers have to be quick, but um, they're just okay. some more specific questions. So what would you in the this of all my guests, what do you wish someone had just like sat you down and told you at the beginning of this journey? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Very easy. I would say say yes to help. Um, Mm. You know, when you say yes to Jesus, um, I kind of feel like the next thing he wants to say to us is now get ready to say yes to everyone I'm going to bring you that's going to help you. And when we bring these kids from hard places into our home and we are not designed to walk this alone. So, yes, while we might be Um, the primary caregivers of these children, we are going to need um, a lot of professionals to surround us. Um, These kids are going to be kind of behind developmentally for good reasons and what they've been through. And so we're going to need a lot of help, um, a lot of uh, people on our team. And, And even in places you might not think it, you know, these kids are so needing us to be their mom, be their dad, Um, that we might have to admit to do and meet their needs. I might need other people to mow my yard or to bring me dinner or to clean my house or to come organize my closets or, you know, like the things that I don't have to do. It's not that I can't still do them. I'm perfectly capable of still cleaning my house. But, you know, you only have so much energy and wherewithal And these kids demand a lot. And so you might go through seasons where you need to reach out to your community group or your church or your your family and say, hey, the needs of my child are getting great. I'm going to need people to wrap around me to keep my hands up because there's only two people that can be their mom and dad. But there is a lot of people that can take care of your yard, your house, you know, um, you know, babysitting needs. So you and your husband can go and have a break and relax Um, all those things are vital um, for your tribe to keep moving forward. It is foolish to think you can do this on your own. Um, The body of Christ is designed to wrap around you when we confess that we're not okay. They're designed to respond to pain. Um, And so if our pride stands in the way, pride comes before a fall. Um, And that's not wise to do this. Um, When we have taken kids that come from hard places, um, we need to rally a village around them. We all play a role. Yes. And sometimes, sometimes that means saying yes to really just uncomfortable stuff. I mean, I had a friend offer to clean my house and I was like, oh my gosh, she's going to see actually how messy my house is. And, um, actually, are you okay with sharing your laundry story? Oh my gosh. Yes. I I actually was (laughs) thinking that when you were just saying that, um, you know, um, in the middle, I, a lot of times when we're in these places, we don't even know how not okay we are. And we don't even know what our needs are. Um, 
you know, because we're just so used to doing things ourselves. And then when we enter into a kid's life that um, comes from a hard place, then we still try to keep doing things the way we did. And we don't realize how we're not okay. And and we're overextending ourselves. And, and so kind of about three months or two to three months into placement, I was drowning and I didn't know it. And I remember several times they would open my laundry door and I would look at the um, bigger than me pile of laundry and I would like want to cry and get in the fetal position and suck my thumb. And so I shut the door and just <laughs> tried to ignore that it was there. And so I didn't even have the wherewithal to ask Jesus for help. Like I didn't even, I wish I could sound super spiritual and be like, oh, I beg Jesus. I can't do my laundry. Send somebody to help me. Just like it didn't I said occur nothing. to you. No, I, I said nothing. I just felt, I felt totally um, incompetent, um, out of control, helpless. And I couldn't understand why that made me feel so awful just to see my laundry and why I couldn't just flip the laundry over. I, I don't know why that was so hard. And so one day I had a um, lady call me. And at this point in time, we didn't know each other very well. Her her two kids were in our student ministry where my husband was a student pastor. And she, she calls me and says, Amy, I keep having like this dream slash I can't get it off in my brain that I'm supposed to call you and say that I'm, I'm supposed to come to your laundry. And I laughed and said, that's crazy. And said, can I think about it? You know, because I don't know about y'all, but laundry is like intimate. That's like your underwear and bra <laughs> and, you know, your husband's underwear. And this is a lady from her church. Like that's awkward, right? <laughs> or it could be. And so I thought about it and my husband said, Amy, you'd be crazy to tell her no. Like, you need all the help you can get. And so I called her back the next day and I said, I confessed to her. I said, every part of me wants to tell you no, but there's another part of me that desperately wants to say yes, um, because I really do need help. And can you give me grace as we walk this out? Because this is going to be hard for me. And she was like, oh, my gosh, yes. And so we got on a schedule and for about the next um Oh, gosh, I can't even remember how long, for a long time, months and months, if not up to a year or later. Um, this sweet, I call her my laundry angel, came to my house every Wednesday. I did not do a lick of laundry. And so every Wednesday, she would come and do every single bit of my laundry. And she would make me sit down with coffee on the couch with her and wouldn't let me move. And she would walk <laughs> around and do my laundry all day long on Wednesday. And we would just talk. We would talk life. We would talk about what's going on in her world. And um, I realized in that moment, like, just like only Jesus can do, as I swallowed my pride and humbly received help that I didn't know how to receive. I'm, I'm a helper. It's hard to receive help. Um, Jesus was healing me in that area and giving me relief in ways I didn't even know I needed it. And then same for my friend. You know, she, we, we joke and we get in fights about who was each other's angel during that time because like I said, I'm a counselor, so I was able to like sit with her and love on her and, and just help her to sort through even what was going on in her world. And so it was just this beautiful connection that pride would have kept me from receiving a crazy big blessing um, in the midst of my, you know, storm. Um, who would have thought, you know, and, and she loves laundry and I love talking to people. So it worked. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay. So the next question is, what is someone you, what is something that you wish you had done differently? I, I wish that I would have gone to counseling myself um, to put words to what was going on with me. Um, I put so much effort into making sure my kids were okay. You know, I mean, I I was filling out um, intake packets for kids for counseling and OT and PT and ST. And I was working so hard on making sure my kids were okay that I completely ignored myself. And that was the biggest mistake that I made in all of that um, because I I needed somebody. I needed to be way more honest with where I was just so I could even see that I was not in a good place. I had no idea. Um, I was just soldiering through um, just like a lot of us adoptive mamas do. And yeah. so I, I would have definitely gone to counseling myself and just allowed myself, you know, at least an hour a week where it was all about me. Yeah. That's, that's a good, that's a really big one. I feel like is, yeah. uh, so many of us ignore for way too long, including me. Um, mm -hmm. okay. So <laughs> what is your favorite way that your tribe supported you slash what is a way that you felt hurt or not supported, um, despite good intentions? So it's kind of a twofer. Well, 
Yeah, well, my favorite is my laundry angel. I mean, there there's nothing um, that I can think of that blessed me more um, than her. Um, it was so practical and so Jesus and um, in, in the way we connected um, that it met so many needs just um, in that moment. And so um, she was she was the the top story to tell. And really, you know, and as far as my tribe hurting me, um, really, as I've thought through that, like I was really, really not good at telling people where I was at. Mm-hmm. My tribe probably thought I was a okay. They probably see me as a pretty strong person and um, that I'm capable of rocking through some hard stuff. And and really, there's not a social script for when children that are older come into your home. We we know what to do when there's infants that come into homes. Yeah. And um, we make a meals and you know we help them out. But there's not really a social script yet. Um, for, for tribes to know how to take care of families that bring older children. Cause you think, well, they're not in diapers. They're not, they're not, they're already potty trained then then they're okay. So, so I, I think, um, when I think back to the hurts, it's really more just, I don't know that my tribe knew where I was at. Um, and, and, and that's where I say, I wish I would have shared more honestly, I, because I believe that my tribe would have, would have came in force to help. Um, most people just don't know how to help. Yeah. Um, they don't, they don't even know that there's probably a need. Um, and so, so yeah, that's what I would say about that. No, no. And I was just going to add on to that, that I feel like a lot of times we get the comments about how we're superwoman or how we're doing so great. And it almost makes it, um, and I, and I don't, this is probably our fault, but it's more, it almost makes it harder for us to tell what's really going on, not necessarily because of pride, but just because it's too hard. Like, being told how great you are, you just want to be like, you just have no idea. And <laughs> sometimes it's easier to just kind of nod and smile. Absolutely. And that's a great point. You know, um, you know, we, when we embark on this adoption foster care journey, we also want and desire others to do it. So it can be kind of scary to be like, yeah, we did it. And, and then when it gets hard, um, it's hard for us from that place to share sometimes because, we don't want others to not do it because our journey looks like crazy. Um, <laughs> and or and honestly, we're in such a war zone that we are afraid that when people hear that, people will say to us, you know, did you make a mistake? Are you not supposed to do it? As if pain is somehow a symptom or a signal that you did something wrong or, or you chose poorly. And so we, we always stay in such a place of warrior mode that it can be hard to let other people in, um, when you're not really sure that they know how to support that actually what they say might make it harder, um, to hang in there and push through. Um, and so I think we've got lots of really good reasons why that is hard. Um, but I would encourage us to do it anyway, um, because that's how our people get to be educated. And, and I just have learned that, you know, confessing where we're really at and allowing people to get curious with us is where, gaps close and people can see real needs and, and man, they rise up to it when they can see where the need is. Yeah, definitely. I, I, we've all seen that just over and over and over again when we can confess Mm -hmm. that people show up. Um, okay. And then lastly, if you could just sum everything up into just one piece of advice or encouragement for adoptive mamas in the, just the throes of it. Yes. I, I would say my number one advice might shock you and I've, I've already kind of alluded to it, is have eyes for yourself. Um, we are the most overlooked people group in the adoption foster care journey movement, whatever you want to call it. Adoptive mamas, man, their hearts take a beating. And we have a lot of vicarious trauma um, that we experience as we begin to walk the healing process with our kids that come from hard places. And so literally number one advice, and I want to say it like 20 times, Um, to our stubborn adoptive mama heart, Um, (laughs) have eyes for yourself. Your pain matters. Your experiences matter. Um, Find um, safe people to talk to about where you're really at and that there's days that you don't like your children. There are days that you wish you hadn't have adopted and foster cared. There are days, I mean, just be real. That stuff is so real um, because we each have our own threshold of pain that we can um, stand up underneath and these, these kiddos in our lives challenge that. And sometimes we go over our threshold and we don't want to do it anymore. Um, or we, we begin to lose heart or we begin to lose our fight. And I just want to say to all their hearts out there, 
um, that's normal um, and to have eyes for yourself and the experiences that you are having in this journey matter and that Jesus wants to heal you in those places so that you have a buffer to do the very things that you want to do on a heart level with your children. Um, if you're not okay, I'm going to say no matter what counselor tells you, you are not going to be able to do what your child needs you to do if you're not okay. Um, and I want you to know it's not, it's, it is okay if you're not okay. And it actually makes sense that you wouldn't be okay because of the war you've chosen to engage in bringing a child from hard places into your home and bring that child close to your heart. Wow. It's just so, so good. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to put that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm going to put just a picture of it for you. Other visual people in the show notes and Amy, where can we find you on social media? Yes. I'm on Instagram, Amy, the Butler all together. Um, and I'm also on Facebook. I believe the same name, Amy the Butler for Facebook. <laughs> I have a Twitter, but I really don't use it. And so really, if you find me there, um, that's where you can connect the best with me. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much. It has been such a blessing to just hear these things over again. So I know it has to be a blessing for everyone listening to it for the first time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Thank you for listening to the Adoptive Mom Podcast. I know this stuff is hard, and I hope you found encouragement here. Remember, you are enough, and you're doing a great job. God wants to be at the center of this journey, and He is big enough to redeem all of our mistakes. Don't forget to check out show notes and other resources at theadoptivemompodcast.com. Thanks again for listening.